I have the benefit of experience, a lot of experience in uh, being able to sort the wheat from the chaff. You have to cross your fingers a lot and yeah. hope things don't happen. But when they do, the only way to deal with it is to, is to, is to build a business that's big enough that it's not going to be a killer to your whole yeah. business plan. And that means diversification and scale. So the, the power business itself, it's all about scale. The bigger the scale, the less a calamity on one project affects the mothership. Yep. Plus, of course, the bigger it is, the lower the cost of capital, which is wealth creating by itself. So getting big really does make a difference in the power business. Clean energy is no exception. If you have a large clean energy company and you're focused on clean energy, you have a niche that investors who want that kind of company will go to. Mm -hmm. The only way you can appeal to them is to stay pure, but be diversified enough to give them the coverage when it's not blowing in, uh, in Texas. Uh, in 2008, when I began my geothermal power company, there were 16 public companies in Australia and Canada, 16 power companies whose name had geothermal in them. Yep. Focus. By 2011 or 2012, there were three. Right. The others had gone, had gone under. There were three. Some of them had gone under through being combined and merged, but the shareholder wealth loss or dissipation in that period from that business was, was colossal. Why? It was sort of the flavor of the month from 2004 to 2008, mm -hmm. 2009. <clears throat> And uh, it was just a, 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 it was a bad business sector. Ask Rick Rule for the lessons he's learned. From no, no, I'm sure, I'm he, sure. He, he was promoting so many of those companies. Proved to be a very tough business. The ones that survived, like mine, uh, survived because we diversified and we grew much, much bigger, which is hard work by itself, but you can, ultimately you can do it. But, but, but when you, let's, let's say you have to close a mine for whatever, there's a, there's a cave-in, yeah. there's something. What's the process of that from a management perspective? Is, where in the scale of the problems that that creates is the shareholder? Because to them, obviously, it's everything. Yeah. And they can overreact and they tend to overreact. You know, as soon as you get yeah. these things happen, <clears throat> people dump the shares because they're terrified of how bad it could be. Do you focus on that at all or can you not do You really you, you can't really can. afford to do that. When you're, like, when you're me in a company, uh, Grant, you're not a seller. You, you right. ca I can't right. sell out, right? I'm, I'm, I've got two outcomes. Either I get bought out I sell once, yep. and I've done that many, many times, but I only do it once. I don't sell along the way. Uh, I buy along the way, but I only sell once. Or if I'm in a company, if I'm building a company that's going to be uh, a long-term operating business, my attitude is I'm going to build that company until I'm no longer needed to be there, mm -hmm. in which case I then either resign or retire or leave it or die or something like that, and, and the company survives my exit in the company, in which case it's a happy ending. Maybe it just at my death, I, the stock is sold when I, when I croak. I mean, uh, <laughs> in other words, um, I don't build these companies to exit along the way. No. Either I get bought out or I, or I, or I hold them until, until the long term. The critical thing is we tell shareholders what we're going to do and we follow through. We execute that plan. The companies that frustrate me are the companies where I, I invest in them, I give them a million dollars to do X, and they go out and spend it on Y. Right. Yep. It drives me crazy, and I never invest in them again. I, I, I don't mind if they, if they take that million dollars, if they say they're going to go and explore a bunch of holes in this place for this commodity, and they come up with nothing. That's fine. Yep. They execute well. That's exactly what I made that bet for. I gave them a million dollars. I understand this risk. I understand I may end up with zero, but I also may end up with $10 million. Yeah. If they, if they got lucky. And I'm prepared to take that risk. And I never whine if it goes to zero because that's the nature of the business. But if they go and divert it somewhere else, then I get mad. So, so pe people watching this who, who, um, who invest, there'll be plenty of people watching it who do invest in resource stocks. There'll be plenty that maybe will end up investing in them. And you invest, not in companies you're on, but you also invest in other companies. What's kind of your checklist? What do you look for in what order of importance and how do you figure out, okay, this is, this is a company worth my investment. Well, the first, uh, it by far, is, is who's involved. Yep. I, I look very carefully at who's involved. And I look at their record, and I, and I often meet them 
um, in conferences or wherever. And I encourage all investors to try to do that, especially with the smaller companies, mm -hmm. to get a measure of the people who are involved. Because at the end of the day, in the smaller companies, not necessarily the big ones, but even it applies there. It's, it's the management that's, that's very important. But really, the second thing, and it's, 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 for me, it's as important, is the quality of the project. I, I do try to look at that carefully. You can't get too cute because you never really know what it's going to be like until you, know, you drill a few holes or until you, until you do a bunch of engineering work to make sure that the gold or copper, whatever it is, can actually be recovered, yeah. uh, which doesn't always happen. Um, um, so I do look at the property. I have the benefit of experience, a lot of experience, in uh, being able to sort the wheat from the chaff and, and looking at quality projects. And so, uh, but even I'll get involved in projects that don't work out. And, and that's, that's just the nature of the business, the risk of the business. So the story there is, I think, again, diversification. You want to have a portfolio of these type of companies. Out of 10 companies, not, not, not 50, not crazy numbers, but, you know, 5 or 10. And you're going to have, you know, 10 or 20% that go to zero. You're going to have, hopefully, maybe 1 out of 10 that really has a huge, huge gain. And the ones in the middle, you're going to maybe get your money back. And yeah. at the end of the day, you're going to outperform uh, on average. Um, now, if you have a portfolio, if you, if you then also step back and try to ignore the noise in the market, the noise in the newspapers, the noise in all the pundits, and actually think for yourself for a minute, travel the world, uh, understand what's happening in the world, and take, take a long view on metal prices. Look at where they are in the cycle. If you buy at the top, it doesn't matter what you buy, it's going to go down if the metal price turns. Similar at the bottom, if you buy almost anything at the yep. bottom, everything will, will rise. The, the, the rising tide floats all ships. Um, but even in that environment, you will get better performance out of certain companies, certain management teams, certain properties than others. And, and that's, I think, the, the thing to, to, to focus on is to think for yourself, identify trends. It's a cyclical business. It's not making a computer. It's not something you have to worry about any revenue. Revenue is set by world prices. Yeah. You don't have control over your revenues. So you've got to understand how these cycles work. And, and they really are, uh, uh, they're somewhat predictable in that you, you know when things are not at the top. You don't know ever when it's going to be at the top. You know when it's not at the top. Yep. If it's sort of, like today, gold is around 1,200 and some. The high was 1,800. Yeah. The next cycle is going to shoot through that. I know that. I absolutely know that. Um, I just don't know when. So buying today is a much better time than buying when gold hit $1,800 five years ago sure. or seven years ago. And when you have that happen, then, then you're going to do well regardless. But you can also do well even in a down market. It's just much more difficult. And for that, you have to be a very astute investor. You have to follow the companies. You have to, you have to be diversified enough to have that, that ability to see losses in a few companies and, and gains in others. Yeah. And then you have to rely on management and on lady luck. Well, this is it. You know, for me, I've always, I always look for management and, and you look for execution. And to your point, doing what you said you were going to do. And really after that, Everything else is slings and arrows. You can't really... It's, it's a little bit slings and arrows, yeah. yeah it's you... a little bit of or a roll of the roulette table. But it's very difficult. You know, I think for individual investors, the only problem you have there is between your ears because you've wrestled with the fact that you might be losing money and people get overcommitted and they, and they do... They keep buying on the way down so they get a much too big a position for their own comfort levels. But institutional investors have to answer to investors. Right, which is really hard. I mean, really I, see, hard. I see institutional investors making the most boneheaded decisions again and again and again because they kind of lose confidence and they don't want to look bad and they sell, the, right. they sell, they sell companies they should hold on to. When things turn a little bit south, they sell these companies. I, I've, I've had that happen more often in my own companies when I see a, a great institutional investor have to sell and then the stock triples. Uh, and I just say, why didn't you hold on? This was going to happen. I could have told you if you'd had, if you'd had the time to phone me or come right, and visit our right. management, I would have told you what we were doing. Instead, you just have this knee-jerk reaction to hit your quarterly numbers to sell, and it's just boneheaded. If you had invested in 1985 or through the last 30 years only in four people, you'd have thousands and thousands and thousands of percent gains over that period. You'd, yeah. have, you'd have had compounded gains of... I'm going to say 25 to 30% per year for, for 20 years yeah. or 30 years, like crazy gains. Me, Lucas Lundin, Richard Wark, 
and Robert Friedel. Those oh, are the four that pop up. Now, there's plenty of other names. There's some great entrepreneurs in Australia. There's some great entrepreneurs in, in England and, and in Toronto. Those are just four names that I know really well. Um, um, a handful of others uh, uh, as well. But, but only those four names, you know, you'd have made it like a real bandit. And, and, and that's all you would have had to invest in. Yeah, but it's against uh, and the that's people. that's talking about yeah. purely people. Yeah. It doesn't matter. You know, I was into nickel and copper and gold and silver. Uh, Freeland's been into all kinds of stuff. Uh, Lundin's mostly oil. It's big hits, actually oil and gas. And, but it's just, he just knows how to create wealth. And I just can't, in my personal world, I can't put a finger to why that is in my world that I've been so lucky and why everybody can't do it. It's not brains. I don't think it's brains. I don't have any more brains than any other guy in this business. Um, but, I, but just, I, I just, well, I just, I treat the money like it's, it's mine and I don't spend it right. crazily. I don't consider other people's money. When I get given shareholder money, I feel it's, it's a great a privilege and it's, and it's, it's an honor to be, guarding it for them as a guardian uh, and I try to spend it I'm known as a very frugal very cheap manager I don't right. pay my people right. very well I, I try I have very low overhead I, I try to treat you know the money like it's like it belongs to my shareholders as it does and um, um, you know I try to spread risk I try to joint venture things if they're really risky I try to spend my own shareholders money on things that are much more certain um, I, I do try to diversify. I try to have lots of balls and lots of uh, lots of places and lot, in the air a lot as much as I can. Also, I'd say um, I try to lead a, a full life myself personally, where I have a really great family and I have a lot of karmic energy from that, and, and it helps my business world. I I love life as well. I love hiking and I love getting outdoors. I'm I'm fairly fairly healthy and fit. And that feeds into the business success somehow. I can't put a tangible value on it, but I think it all, it all kinds of fits in a, in a box. When you talk about it's not intelligence, I think there's a certain, there is a certain intelligence that comes through as you have success and you have failure, you learn what was successful and you learn yeah, what not to do. That's true. Success, success begets success yeah. and, 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 and failure almost implies you're going to keep failing because you don't have the... You know, right now, um, I have the financial resources that I never had before. And just for that reason alone, I was able to prop up my clean energy company again and again when it needed money. Yeah. If I didn't have that ability to, to help it, it wouldn't have gone through those tough years. With, with Equinox Gold now, I have the financial capacity to, 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 to sort of support it. Even if we're wrong in the gold price, the gold price goes down, the assets we're building now that are going to have great value if the gold price goes down, that, that value is going to disappear. Yeah. Well, I have the capacity to, 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 to bail that company out, and that alone is going to ensure its success. Because I'll end up just, if, if I have to buy shares at, at a lower price, I'll buy the whole company. Right. I mean, I can afford to do that now. So, uh, so that's a nice little thing to have in my pocket now that I never used to have. Um, and it's, it's reassuring as well. 